Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Thursday Thought, I want to talk to you guys about an email I received, a, a statement that was made by a friend of mine, uh, someone that I regularly correspond with over email that, that I appreciate very much. I consider him to be a friend, and he's offered some very wise counsel. And this particular brother made a comment that culturally I understand where he's coming from, but it's something that I don't agree with on a theological or cultural level. And so I, I don't want to call him out. I do want to call out this idea that he brought up. Now he starts off letting me know that I made a mistake in one of the videos I made. And he didn't clarify as to which one it was. Um, I did ask him to make a note on that video of my error. Uh, he states that, that I, I mentioned that Mary Magdalene may have been a prostitute. And I do know that there are some, particularly in Catholicism, that do believe that she was. I do not know if she was or not. My understanding is that she isn't. So I'm very, or she wasn't rather. And so I was rather surprised that I may have said this. Now, I do do all these videos off the cuff. So I, I may have said it in error, in error. I may have said it as something that some people believe as I'm doing now. Um, I do know that, that there are people who believe she was possessed by demons. There are people who believe that she was a prostitute. There are people that, that associate, there's a lot of different Marys in the New Testament. And so there's a lot of people that will associate Mary Magdalene with these negative constraints. And he makes a very good point, and I don't disagree with him. He says that one of the reasons why people in some churches like to talk bad, if you will, culturally bad about Mary Magdalene, is because of the fact that they don't like the idea of women being in a position of power. And it's very clear that Mary Magdalene was very special to Jesus. A lot of people in the Latter-day Saint movement believe that Mary Magdalene was Jesus' wife, and myself included. And so then the question becomes, can Mary Magdalene be the wife of Jesus or the apostle to the apostles, as some extra-biblical sources say, or identify her as? Can she be this great person if she was possessed by demons or if she was a prostitute i think that that's a a fair question because of our cultural mindset today and i want to address it as my thursday thought because i think that this cultural misunderstanding is important now i want to start with he sent one email and he sent a second email that says just thought of something she may even be your great 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 grandmother think about it um i am going to tell you up front and, and my wife will testify to this also. I am a grandma's boy. Um, both my grandmothers have passed, and I loved both of them very, very, very much. And I still miss them quite a bit. And so this idea that Mary Magdalene could be in my family line or could be my own grandmother or great great grandmother, that is something that has an emotional reaction from me but that remo that that emotional reaction isn't shame for any of the females in my lineage that emotion is disgust because we would degrade women because of something that is beyond their own circumstances or a lifestyle choice that a, a decision that they made for their well-being so I want to make a couple of points. The first is that in the Torah, prostitution is not technically illegal. Now, I know that our modern understanding of adultery is very different than the way that the ancient Israelites saw adultery. And I don't know what Moses taught them exactly when he came down from the mount. But I can tell you that in the time of Jesus in particular, and I know before then as well, women were seen as property. They were something, not someone. And they were something to be owned. Now, maybe it's just because my modern morals are different, but I find that reprehensible. And I love when Jesus is asked, you know, when this woman is married to a man and he dies. And so his brother, she becomes married to that brother, then he dies and so on and so forth, so all the brothers die. 
in the resurrection, who owns this woman? The answer that Jesus gives is so profound because he says something that they couldn't even understand probably even 100 years ago from right now, let alone when he said it. In heaven, women aren't going to be owned. They're not going to be bought and sold. Now, I know growing up in the Latter-day Saint tradition, when people would talk against the idea that the uh, Salt Lake City Church has on sealing families forever, they would point to that passage and say, well, see, look here, marriage isn't going to happen in heaven. That, that's what this is saying. And that's, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that women won't be property. They won't be owned. And I, I think that's an important thing that we need to understand first off and foremost. So whatever it is that Moses taught or any prophet since him up until the current days, if they see this idea of adultery as the woman is owned by the father and then sold to the husband and she is property that if you have relations with her, then you are committing adultery because you are taking something that is not yours and belongs to someone else. I, I genuinely do not believe that that is what God meant by adultery in the Ten Commandments. Because I do see women as people and not as property. And I think that the idea that even today, even today, right now, here in Ohio, there is, I'm not going to get too political here, but the question is being asked, and it's on our ballots, are women people or are they property? Do they have the ability and the right to think for themselves or should men and the state control them? And it's a very, very big debate here in Ohio and I'm sure all over the country. And I know that it's still a problem worldwide and I don't, I don't comprehend it. I don't understand why even some women don't see women as people. It's just not a concept that I can really wrap my brain around and um yeah it's just confusing so prostitution in the bible let's talk about that it was illegal for a man to sell his wife it was illegal for or unlawful for a father to sell his daughter and it is illegal for a man or a woman to be a prostitute for any deity even even Yahweh, Jehovah, the, the God of the, of the Bible and Book of Mormon. So some people will say, well, that means that prostitution was not legal, except that women couldn't really work or own property. And so prostitution was something that a woman would have to do if she was a, you know, without a, any sons or any man whatsoever. It, it was just the way that the world was. And then the question becomes, well, at that point, why is prostitution such a threat? Likely because that's a woman re recognizing and realizing she can take control over her own life, over her own, her own path. And culturally, that is very, very unacceptable. It's still even unacceptable here in the United States today, as I, as I noted. I, I've even heard various modern, still living at this moment, leaders of one particular branch comment that the only reason women exist is because they're here to raise sons. And it, it's, it's reprehensible, this idea. So what if my grandmother, either one of them, who I love and cherish, or any other woman in my family tree, what if they were a prostitute? How would I feel about that? Well, let's think back and look at what happened with Jesus and his ancestry. One woman was in a situation where her husband died and she was given to each brother and the brothers were commanded to help her have a son. And they refused. And so God killed all of them. And finally, she pretended to be a prostitute. And the grandfather, the father-in-law, got her pregnant with a boy. He was freaking out because he was supposed to pay her. And when he sent people to go and bring her, her, her fee, and she wasn't there. The great sin that he was committing wasn't being with a prostitute. It was not paying for the service. 
And then when he found out about the deception and discovered that this was his daughter-in-law, he's like, oh, okay, great. Everything's fine then. And she is one of the great, great, great grandmothers of Jesus Christ. And if we look at Matthew 1, 5, which gives the genealogy of Jesus, it mentions that, and I'm, I'm probably not pronouncing his name right. I'm terrible with these Bible and Book of Mormon names. Uh, Rahab, that she was one of the great, great, great grandmothers of Jesus. But who was she? Well, if you look at Joshua 2, 1, we find out that there is a harlot and that harlot's name is Rahab. So again, there's a woman who pretended to be a prostitute, which the sin there again was not paying her by this dutiful man of God. And then this woman who was the harlot that smuggled two spies secretly out of the city of Jericho so that uh, Joshua could come in and take the city. And she was spared and she became a part of Israel. So let's ask the question, because I, I know that some people are gonna watch this video, they're gonna say, is Dave saying that prostitution should be legal, that prostitution isn't a sin, and, and that we shouldn't have to obey the law of chastity and things like this. The first thing I wanna state is that growing up in the Brighamite church, I was taught this idea of a law of chastity and I took it very, very seriously. When I got older, I wanted to really study these temple covenants. Where do they come from? And I discovered that there is no law of chastity in the scriptures. There's the, the commandment that says not to commit adultery. So what is the law of chastity? Well, I did some more research and, and I'm just giving you my, my notes, if you will. But the law of chastity changes depending on who's running the show in that particular branch of the faith. I personally believe that the idea of the law of chastity was invented because of polygamy. You're going into this temple to take out these endowments. You're going to be sealed to multiple women. And that's not adultery because you're all married. And also, you can't be committing adultery because you have taken upon yourself the law of chastity. So I think that it's something that was created by Brigham Young and his people to make the idea of polygamy look more appealing. And I'm not saying that that is good or bad. I'm saying I think that's what happened. And I think that here in the United States, we are a very Puritan culture and or we come from a very Puritan culture. And so the idea of sex being a positive thing is very frowned upon. Generally speaking, conservative Americans see sex as being a negative thing. It's something that the Lord gave us and he gave us this gift for procreation. And I was raised taught that it's really not supposed to be used. But that's not what the scriptures say. And it's definitely not what we learn studying the actual Torah and the actual laws of God in the gospels or anywhere else in the scriptures. So does that mean that we should just go out and do whatever we want? Well, no, of course not. I think that there should be moderation in all things and prudence in all things. I think that there's a middle ground here that we can reach between owning women as property and sex being a horrible thing that we avoid or anything over in that area and just going crazy and doing whatever, you know, whatever comes to our, our, our whims and fancies. I think that we need to respect women as people because they, they are people. Gone are the days when we're questioning whether or not women have souls. We know that women are supposed to be ordained to the priesthood. So therefore, they are on equal footing with men. They have the ability, that they, they are cognizant, they are aware. They have the right to decide with educated doctors and other people that they trust, family and other loved ones, and prayerfully to the Lord, how and what to do with their own bodies. Women, we expect women to teach our children, but the culture that oppresses women doesn't, they don't want women to learn or know things. 
So how are they supposed to teach our sons if they are uneducated, un unaware, and feel that they don't have any reason to exist except to serve men? But the most important thing for me here is this idea that our God is weak. I was raised with the idea that God isn't powerful enough. God is not strong enough. The atonement isn't encompassing enough to forgive all sins. I was told that there are some sins, I was taught growing up, that there are some sins that are so vile and so bad that even Jesus can't fully atone for them. And I think this idea of a weak God is not only incorrect, but also a huge misunderstanding. If someone is a prostitute in a way, in a manner that violates the Torah, the atonement of Jesus Christ can make up for that. In the Torah, it is clear that there are ways for people to be forgiven for all sins. And I do believe that when it says that certain sins require people to be put to death, I, I believe that that is, means spiritual death and that they will be spiritually born again through Jesus Christ. I do believe that the atonement of Jesus Christ is all powerful. And so if I found out that anyone in my line was a prostitute, whether it's because that was their choice and it was what made sense in that moment, or because it was, they were doing so it was a sin, I don't have a problem with it either way. Because I believe in the atonement of Jesus Christ, and I respect a woman's right to think for herself. And if she was forced into prostitution, that sin is not on her head. And therefore, I'm not going to be embarrassed by what she went through. Instead, I'm going to be enraged in what she suffered from and through. And there's a big difference between the two. So, brothers and sisters, I know this is a bit of a more serious topic. I know it's one that makes people very uncomfortable. But I want to bear you my testimony. And, and this, in my mind, is one of the reasons why the fellowship exists. I want to bear you my testimony that women are people. That women are equal to men. That's why Eve came... I don't believe she actually came from Adam's side. But I believe the reason why... It is stated that way is because the Lord is telling us that men and women were created to be equals. Not from the head to where she rules over him, not from the feet to where he rules over her, but from the side so that they can stand together and be one. And if she is homosexual, then she can stand side by side by another woman and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I also want to bear you my testimony that the weakest point of the atonement has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. He is all-powerful. His atonement is all-powerful. The weakest point of it is whatever weakness we pretend that it has. Do not let Satan tell you that anything you ever did made you not good enough for our God. Because I promise you, you are never not good enough for our God. And you can sit there and think of every person, every monster, every excuse. But the moment that we're born again, all of that is behind us. And yes, in this life, there may be consequences for certain things that we do that are wrong. But the atonement is infinite and all forgiving and all powerful. So do not let Satan try to trick you into believing that you're not good enough or that anybody else isn't good enough either. I was raised in a community where there were children that were born out of wedlock and they were told they were abominations. Imagine that, growing up believing that you're an abomination because it's what you're taught in church, because it's what you're taught by your own parents and grandparents. Now, I do want to be clear that these people were Protestants. The, the people I'm talking about here, they were not members of any Latter-day Saint church that I'm aware of. But that doesn't mean that the church I was raised in doesn't have its faults. There are stories of that I was told at the pulpit of girls who were 12 years old 
and convinced that they should have a baby when they were impregnated by the worst, the most abysmal of circumstances, only to give that baby up to a righteous family as if somehow she had sinned as a 12-year-old girl. The church I was raised in loves breaking up families, destroying families, and giving those children to the more righteous people. And that is a sin that if they do not seek the atonement of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of, they will have to repent of at some point. Now, I, I do echo the words that Jesus said upon the cross, forgive them, Father, for they knew not what they do. But I'm telling you because I know better. And now you know better. So let's go out and let's be better. Let's recognize the personhood of women. Let's recognize the rights of women. Let's encourage the equality of all genders, of all races, of all people. That's my prayer, my testimony, my Thursday thought. And I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.